Hello champions, I hope you all are doing great. My name is Biswajit, I am your botany teacher. Today we are going to start the last chapter of plant physiology that is plant growth and development. This chapter is very very important for NEET exam. So don't take it lightly and please watch this lecture very carefully religiously. So the topics which we are going to cover today are plant growth, okay. Photopedism growth is measurable. So these are the different topics which we are going to cover. In fact, we are going to cover the entire chapter. We are not going to leave even a single topic of this chapter. So the first thing which we will discuss is growth, plant growth. Every organism, whether the organism is plant or animal, microscopic or macroscopic, every organism is capable of growth. And that is why we can say that growth is a fundamental feature of every organism. In fact, this is also, also a feature of cell. That means cell is also capable of growth. Okay, And no doubt, non-living objects also show growth, but there is a difference in the growth of living organism and non-living entity. What are the differences? Living organisms, they show intrinsic growth, that means internal growth. They show irreversible growth and they do not require any external agent to grow. But in case of non-living entity, the growth is extrinsic, it is reversible and it requires external agent like water, air, etc, etc. Okay, and we know plant is a living organism and that is why the growth in case of plant will be irreversible. And when I say the plant is growing or the plant is showing growth, that means there will be irreversible increase in the size of what plant organ or the part of the plant organ. So I will say irreversible increase in the size of plant organ or part of the plant organ is, an, is basically plant growth. Okay, And this plant growth or growth of any organism that, that is due to metabolism. Every organism shows growth and the growth of every organism is due to metabolism and the metabolism requires energy and the energy used during metabolism is mainly in the form of ATP and that is why we call this ATP as energy currency of cell, right, which is produced uh, maximum in the mitochondria, which is powerhouse of cell, right. So, uh, we know that metabolism is basically of two types. Okay, one is anabolism, second is the catabolism. So, there are three possibilities. First, where the anabolism or the synthesis process will be more than that of the catabolism, that is breakdown process. In that case, there will be positive growth. Okay, and the positive growth can simply be written as growth. Okay, but if the catabolism is more as compared to anabolism, there will be negative growth and that negative growth is called as degrowth. Okay, and if the anabolism is equals to the catabolism, in that case, there will be net zero growth. So, when the plant is going to show positive growth, if the amount of synthesis or biosynthetic processes is more than that of the breakdown processes, that is catabolism. Okay, and the plant growth can be called as unique, it can be called as localized, it can be called as open. Why? No doubt every organism shows growth, but it is only plants which is capable of showing unlimited growth. Only plants can show unlimited growth and that is why we call plant growth as unique. So what is the reason? The reason is because the plant shows unlimited growth. Okay, And this unlimited growth can also be called as indeterminate growth. indeterminate growth or you can also call this as indefinite growth okay but the very important point here to note is that no doubt plant shows unlimited growth but every plant organ does not show unlimited growth certain organs like root and the stem they show unlimited growth but if i take the example of leaf flower fruit or seed they show limited growth hence i can say as a whole, as a whole plant shows unlimited growth, but if I take the example of plant organs, then I will say some organs they show limited growth and some organs they show unlimited growth. Okay, so I will write that part. Some organs they show limited growth.
okay and some other organs they show unlimited growth and i have already mentioned you the examples you can mention those examples there we know growth is basically irreversible increase in number of cells and mass and the increase in the number of cells is due to cell division right and in case of plants the cell division takes place in a specific tissue and the tissue is meristematic tissue and because the meristem which is responsible for growth of plant they are present at certain locations specific locations that is why the growth will also take place at specific location hence the plant growth is localized so i will say plant growth is localized why because the meristem responsible for growth they are present at specific location And because these are present at specific locations, that is why growth will also take place at specific locations. So I will say, and that therefore, growth in plants, they take place at specific location. Hence, the plant growth is localized. Why do we call plant growth, uh, plant growth, is, uh, plant growth has opened? Because during plant growth, the meristematic cells, they keep on dividing and they add new cells continuously and because new cells are continuously added to the plant body that is why the plant growth is said to be open why do we call this as plant plant growth is open because new cells are continuously added to the plant body okay so we have learned so far about plant growth the plant growth is irreversible process okay and it is due to metabolism of which requires atp the plant growth is unique the plant growth is localized and the plant growth is open now we will talk about the growth of cell as we said just before some time that growth is a feature of cell as well and the growth and if i take uh, the different phases of cell cycle we have learned that uh, learned that the growth of the cell takes place throughout the cell cycle but maximum growth takes place in the interface right and during the cell growth there will be increase in the protoplasmic content okay there will be increase in protoplasmic content and when i say there is increase in protoplasmic content that means the number of cell organelles will increase the amount of various chemicals will also increase that means there will be synthesis of different types of chemicals like proteins rna etc etc okay and because of the synthesis of different types of chemicals and increase in the number of cell organelles there will be increase in the protoplasmic content and if there is increase in the protoplasmic content i will say growth is taking place in this cell and this increase in the protoplasmic content is difficult to measure and because it is difficult to measure the increase in the protoplasmic content that is why we use some indirect measures to measure the growth so what are the different indirect measures to measure growth the measures are increase in the length increase in the surface area increase in the volume of different plant organs okay increase in the weight of the plant organs increase in the number of cells and increase in the cell size so these these are the different measures of what plant growth okay so let us talk about the increase in weight so weight is of two types fresh weight and dry weight fresh weight includes water fresh weight if you remove water from the fresh weight the weight which you get is dry weight so if there is increase in fresh weight even or the dry weight there is growth taking place okay and but but the important point here is which one should we prefer to measure the growth it is the dry weight why because fresh weight the the fre the, uh, the fresh weight includes water and the amount of water varies with season and that is why we should not consider fresh weight okay so i will say if there is increase in the fresh weight okay so if the fresh weight of different plant organs is increasing or if there is increase in the dry weight of various plant organs 
so i will say growth is taking place but which one should we prefer dry wet should be prefer why because fresh wet includes water which varies with season okay in the plant organ what about the increase in the length okay so if i take the example of root or stem the their length keeps on increasing that means they, they are showing growth okay and let me give you another example so suppose this is the carpel the carpel will have style okay so this is the style and this is the ovary swollen part and this is the stigma and here suppose i am having the suppose i am having the pollen grain so this is pollen grain now the pollen grain will germinate okay and when the pollen grain germinates it will produce the pollen tube so this is the pollen tube now you can see the length of the pollen tube is very very small but with time what will happen it the length will increase okay so there is increase in the length of pollen tube and this increase in the length of pollen tube is an example of water growth so i can say the increase of so this is pollen tube okay and this one is the pollen grain right so i can say the increase in the length of what pollen tube or what or root or shoot they are the examples of what growth what about surface area sa is nothing but the surface area and this measure we use for which structures those organs which are flat so i will say this increase in the surface area is used for flat organs like leaf like leaf okay and the ncrt has written about dorsi ventral leaf so if there is increase in the size surface area of the dorsi ventral leaf that is the uh, dicot leaf there is growth what about increase in the volume okay so if you take the example of any storage organ or fruit the, uh, and we know the fruit or the storage uh, the various storage organs of the plant their volume also keeps on increasing and that increase in the volume is an example of what example of what or uh, example of example of growth so i can say i can take what storage organ or fruit here also i can say uh, i can take the example of what storage organ or fruit okay now what about the increase in the number of cells increase in the number of cells so suppose let me take what let me let me take one example of what meristematic cell and which meristematic cell uh, root apical meristematic cell of maize so let me take the example of what maize plant okay and in maize plant one if i take one root apical meristem root apical maize stem so from this single root apical maize stem in the maize plant i can get i can get 17500 cells in just one hour so in one hour i can get this many cells from a single cell and that means there is increase in the number of cells because of what because of cell division and the cell division in this case is nothing but the mitosis repeated mitosis okay and that is why there is growth and this example is given in the ncrt and every line of ncrt is important for your neat exam now what about the increase in the cell size and for for this one also the ncrt has given one example and the example is cucumber cell okay so one cucumber cell can show huge amount of growth okay huge amount of increase in its cell size okay how much so how much can it grow so it can grow up to it can grow up to 3 lakh 50000 times so this many time the size of the cell of a cucumber can, so not cucumber sorry watermelon very sorry watermelon okay so this is the example of what growth okay so these are the different measures of what growth now let us try to understand about growth rate so what is growth rate growth rate is nothing but the growth per unit time how much growth takes place 
per unit time that is growth rate and growth rate is of two types absolute growth rate and relative growth rate to understand this let us try to understand with the help of the diagram so suppose this is a leaf okay and this leaf is a and after certain time let us say after one week after one week the growth took place and the size uh, the uh, the uh, and uh, the size increased and the size increased and it be and the the leaf became like this okay so initially initially the size of the leaf was this much but after one week the size became this much okay and suppose and suppose initially the size of the cell uh, not cell the leaf was leaf was 5 cm square 5 cm square after one week it became 10 cm square initially it was 5 cm square after one week the size of the leaf became 10 cm square and suppose suppose this is the leaf initially okay and uh, and the size or the surface area of the leaf was suppose 50 cm square and after one week after one week the growth took place and this became like this much okay this much so initially initially the size was this much okay but after one week after one week the cell size not cell size sorry the size of the leaf became this much okay and suppose uh, after one week uh, the leaf grew and the size was 55 centimeter square how much 55 centimeter square okay so with the help of these two examples i will explain you what are the differences about absolute growth rate and relative growth rate so what is actually absolute growth rate absolute growth rate is nothing but the amount of actual growth amount of actual growth which takes place per unit time so i can say actual growth per time upon time that will be the absolute growth rate so what about relative growth rate relative growth rate is amount of actual growth which takes place in different plant organs per initial value okay initial value and this initial value i can take the example of what size initial size or initial initial uh, initial volume or initial length whatever you can consider into time into time okay so into 100 so this is relative growth rate this is relative growth rate okay so for this leaf a the small leaf a what is what, what will be the value of absolute growth rate what will be the what will be the value of absolute growth rate i have to put this formula right so the final the final size was uh, was uh, 10 cm square and the initial size was 5 cm square so the uh, the uh, the actual growth will be 10 minus 5 and what is the time the time is one week the time is one week so the value will be 5 cm square per week the value will be 5 cm square per week what about this one okay so this one will be 55 minus 50 upon what upon uh, one week so this will be also 5 cm square per week 5 cm square per week so the, the value will be 5 cm per week here also 5 cm square per week okay so this is absolute growth rate what about relative growth rate what about relative growth rate okay so for this uh, i have to put this formula for relative growth rate so here it will be 10 minus 5 upon what is the initial value the initial value was 5 okay and what is the time 1 in 200 so it will be 5 upon 5 in 200 so it will be 100 percent so the relative growth rate in case of this leaf a is 100 percent what about leaf b 55 minus 50 upon initial value was 50 the initial value was 50 in two times so one week so it will in 200 so it will be 5 upon 50 in 200 that will be 5 upon 50 in 200 means uh, 10 percent it will be 10 percent it will be 10 percent so you can clearly see in this case that this in both leaf a and b absolute growth rate is same but relative growth rate is different okay so if if i give you two different organs 
then I can say their absolute growth rate can be same, but relative growth rate will not be same. Okay, and if I repeat, if two different organs of different size they have same relative growth, same absolute growth rate, then they will have different relative growth rate. And the organ which has which has smaller size that will have more that will have more relative growth rate as compared to the organ which has which has larger size. Okay, so this is this was about the growth rates. Okay, growth per unit time is growth rate. It is of two types: absolute growth rate and relative growth rate. Two different organs of different sizes they may have same absolute growth rate. It is not always necessary that uh, they will have same growth rate, but they may have same growth rate. And if they have same growth rate, same absolute they have sa same absolute growth rate, then they will have different relative growth rate. And the org the organ with smaller uh, smaller uh, the smaller uh, what uh, size will have more relative growth rate why because in uh, in the formula it is written right so if the initial value in initial size is less then the relative growth rate will be more fine so this was about growth rate now let us try to understand about the types of growth in plant types of growth in plants so the plant organs they show some organs they show unlimited growth some organs this show limited growth and during growth during growth there is increase in the size of uh, there is increase in the number of cells so how the number of cells will increase depending upon that we can classify the growth in plant in two types one is one is arithmetic growth and second is the geometric growth so suppose this is a parent cell and it divides to produce two daughter cells okay and out of these two daughter cells one undergoes further division whereas the other daughter cell undergoes differentiation okay so this this cell is undergoing what this cell is undergoing going differentiation okay so i can say this one as differentiated cell so i will say this is the parent cell this is the parent cell and these are the daughter cells and out of these two daughter cells one is dividing further whereas the other undergoes differentiation and, and it will not divide and these are the these are the two daughter cells of this parent cell and out of these two one is dividing but the other one is undergoing differentiation okay and here also uh, these are the two daughter cells of this parent cell and out of these two one will divide this one will divide this one will divide but this one will undergo differentiation so any growth any growth so or i can say the growth in the plant in which out of two daughter cells only one keeps on dividing but the other undergoes differentiation and it will not divide that type of growth is called as arithmetic growth okay so here i'll say one of the daughter cells two daughter cells, dcs is daughter cells okay one of the two daughter cells divide that is called as arithmetic growth so what about the second one the second one second one will undergo differentiation okay but but suppose this is a parent cell it is dividing to produce two daughter cells and both these daughter cells they keep on dividing so if both the daughter cells they divide that is geometric growth if only one daughter cell divides that is arithmetic growth okay and in case of arithmetic growth the growth rate is constant the growth rate is constant but in case of arithmetic growth so geometric growth the growth rate is variable okay the growth rate is variable with time the growth rate will vary what about the growth curve in case of arithmetic growth linear growth curve is obtained but in case of geometric growth sigmoid or s shaped growth curve is obtained okay and where do you find this uh, this type of growth in plant so the initial stage the at the initial stage of embryonic development the growth is is of geometric type i will repeat during the initial development of embryo from zygote the growth is of geometric type but the later stage of the embryonic development from the zygote will be of arithmetic type and the growth of the root tip or the growth of the shoot tip is of what arithmetic growth okay so let us try to uh, draw the graph for them so this is the time on the x axis i am taking the time and on y axis i am taking the growth rate i am taking the growth rate okay so the growth rate will be what suppose this was the initial value 
एंड सपोज दिस वॉज द इनिशियल लेंथ ऑफ एनी प्लांट ऑर्गन लेंथ ओके एल फोर लेंथ इनिशियल लेंथ ओके एंड विथ टाइम द लेंथ ऑफ द प्लांट ऑर्गन विल कीप ऑन इंक्रीजिंग इट विल कीप ऑन इंक्रीजिंग एंड सपोज दिस विल दिस इज इंक्रीजिंग लाइक दिस इन ए लीनियर मैनर इट इज इंक्रीजिंग ओके एंड आफ्टर आफ्टर टाइम टी सपोज आफ्टर टाइम टी After time t, suppose the length was this much. This was the length. Okay, so I can I can write for this that uh, L t will be L t will be L naught plus R t, where t is the total time for growth. Okay, t is the total time for growth and and uh, l not is the initial length and lt is the final length lt is the final length okay so what about the geometric growth okay so here also i'm taking the time and here also i'm taking the growth rate what growth rate okay and okay sorry i should not take growth rate okay very sorry i should take growth here i should take growth how much growth is taking place how much growth is taking place okay so here let me take uh i can take growth or i i should take rather rather i should take suppose length suppose i'm taking the length here length okay length length is better length is better very sorry for that here i'm uh, here i can take length or weight or volume whatever i can take okay so i can say i can take length or i can take weight also or i can take volume whatever Uh, parameter you can take okay so they are increasing on the y axis and i have taken t okay very sorry for this i have i have taken length here and i have taken i can take length or i can take uh, take weight or i can take volume of different plant organs okay so how the growth growth will take place during the geometric growth okay so suppose suppose this was the initial weight this was the initial weight of the plant organ so with time the growth of the plant organ will take place so initially the growth was at very slow rate then the growth will increase exponentially then it will become constant okay so you can see there is a s shaped growth and this is called as sigmoid growth curve okay sigmoid growth curve and this phase where the growth rate is very slow that is called as lag phase okay and this phase is called this phase is called as log phase or you can say exponential phase and this phase is the stationary phase this phase is stationary phase okay and maximum growth of the plant organ takes place in the log phase and remember one thing most of the plant organs or the most of the plants they show what sigmoid type of growth curve okay so this was about different types of growth plant growth one is arithmetic second is the geometric okay now let us talk about the conditions for plant growth what are the requirements for the plant growth different types of um, uh, different types of agents are responsible for plant growth and let me tell you one, them uh, discuss them one by one so what are the requirements of plant growth we need for plant growth we need water we need nutrient we need oxygen so these are the three different things which are required for plant growth and these three different things are very very essential these three different things they are very very essential for plant growth that means if these three things are not available in optimum concentration or optimum co amount then the plant growth will not take place properly and they are they they must be present in optimum concentration for proper plant growth apart from these three things the plant growth also requires other things like temperature okay and it also requires water uh, sorry gravity that means it is it is also the growth of the plant is also affected by gravity and light and remember one thing remember one thing as per ncrt these two factors that is gravity and light they are not used or they are not going to affect plant growth at every phase of growth they are required at certain phase of growth so i will write here they are required at
certain phase of plant growth they are not required at every phase of plant growth okay so let us try to understand how this these factors they are going to affect or control the plant growth okay so let me tell you about water first water acts as a medium for met metabolic reactions or enzyme enzymatic activity and if the amount of water in an organism or cell is more there will be more metabolism there will be more growth and if the water content is very less there will be less metabolism or i can say the cell or the organism is metabolically inactive okay so and, and that is and that is why when there is seed dormancy that means when there is inactive embryo in the dormant seed the embryonic cells they are dehydrated okay that means if the amount of water in the cell is less the cells will be inactive they will not be dead they will be inactive okay if you remove the water uh, fully the cell will be dead but if the water is present but it in minimum amount which can support the life that is then i will say the cell will be in inactive state okay so when the embryo is formed when the embryo is formed within the seed whether the, the, the seed is of di, uh, is of angiosperm or the gymnosperm whenever the seed is formed within the seed embryo will also be formed and the embryo will be active initially but after some time what will happen the cells of the embryo they will undergo dehydration and due to dehydration the cells of the embryo will become metabolically less active so the embryo as a whole will become metabolically inactive or i can say uh, I, I will say the embryo will be inactive or dormant okay so during do do dormancy the, you will see that the water is going to play an important role Wha how so i will say uh, the water content of the embryo is reducing okay and that is why the embryo is capable of showing the dormancy what about the nutrient what about the nutrient for plants, the nutrient is of two types, macronutrient and micronutrient. Macronutrients, they can also be called as macro elements. Micronutrients, they can be called as micro elements or, or trace elements. And both these, type, both these two groups of elements or nutrients, they are required to synthesize different protoplasmic content and they are also required to form different types of energy related compounds like chlorophyll and ATP. For chlorophyll synthesis, uh, we need we, uh, we need the magnesium, and it also requires the iron and other things. Okay, and for uh, and for ATP, I require the mag uh, ATP for I require the phosphorus. Okay, so I repeat, uh, both types of elements or nutrients, macro and micronutrients, they are required to synthesize different protoplasmic contents and to synthesize different types of energy related structures or molecules like atp and chlorophyll okay and this is how they are going to help the growth okay now what about o2 i said the growth of the organism is due to metabolism and the metabolism requires energy mainly in the form of atp and this atp comes from the respiration and the respiration will be aerobic so if o2 is not present there will be no aerobic respiration and if there is no respiration there will be no atp if there is no atp that means there will be no metabolism and if there is no metabolism there will be no growth that is that is why oxygen or the aeration is must for the plant growth what about the temperature we know growth is due to metabolism and the metabolism consists of metabolic reactions and the metabolic reactions are catalyzed by enzymes and the enzymes activity is controlled by temperature for optimum activity or maximum activity of the of the enzyme we need to provide the enzyme optimum temperature if you decrease the temperature the enzyme will become inactive and the activity of the enzyme will decrease and if you increase the temperature the enzyme will undergo denaturation and it the activity will decrease so for proper uh, activity of the enzyme or for proper metabolism the temperature should be optimum okay now what about gravity we know different types of structures they respond to gravity for example the radical will grow towards the gravity it will show positive geotropic growth whereas the plumule it will grow away from the gravity that means it will show negative geotropism okay what about light the light also affects growth during seed germination certain seeds 
they require light and such seeds which require the presence of light for dom uh, for germination they are said to be photoblastic seeds photoblastic seeds okay and uh, and once the seed is germinated uh, there will be formation of new leaves okay but before before formation of new leaves the, the before formation of new leaves uh, the plant is going to use the food which is stored in this cotyledon okay but uh, and once the seed once the new leaves are formed the new leaves will start producing food with the help of uh, by the process of photosynthesis which requires light and the light that means i can say when the germination takes place new leaf uh, 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 and seedling is formed ultimately new leaves will be formed and those new leaves will undergo not undergo will will perform photosynthesis which requires light to produce new food and uh, to produce food and that food will be used by the plant for its growth okay so initial at initial stage the plant is not going to use the not 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 going to use light okay why because at initial stage there is no photosynthetic leaf there is no photosynthetic leaf once the photosynthetic leaf is formed then only the light is going to play its role for growth okay for photo to, for allowing the plant to perform photosynthesis right so these are the different factors or conditions which are required for plant growth now let us try to understand some terms which are given in the ncrt okay and remember one thing if there is a cell which is dividing it will not have specialized structure specialized function and if the cell is non dividing the cell will have that means if a cell has stopped dividing the cell will become structurally and functionally specialized okay so suppose there is a cell which has which is dividing and it has no specific no specific structure no specific function that is why i have written structurally and functionally not specialized and that type of cell which is dividing and structurally and functionally not specialized they are said they are called as undifferentiated cell they are called as undifferentiated cell uc is undifferentiated cell and suppose this cell underwent a process and in that process the cell became non dividing that means during that process the cell lost its ability to divide and it became structurally and functionally specialized and that process in which the cell stops uh, dividing and it becomes structurally and functionally specialized that process is called as differentiation what do you call that process you call that process as differentiation okay and suppose the differentiated differentiated cell okay and the cell which is produced due to differentiation is differentiated cell so the differentiated cell is non dividing it is structurally and functionally specialized and now suppose this differentiated cell again underwent a process in which it's it it regained the ability to divide that means it became dividing and it lost its ability to Uh, lost its structural and functional speci speciality. That means it became structurally and functionally non-specialized. And such cells are said to be de-differentiated cells. And the process in which a non-dividing cell regains the ability to divide and it loses uh, loses structural and functional speciality is called as speciality is called as de-differentiation. What do you call that process? You call that process as de-differentiation. and the cell which we get due to de-differentiation is de-differentiated cell okay the process is differentiation the cell which we get is differentiated cell the process is de-differentiation so the cell which we get is de-differentiated cell okay and suppose this dividing cell again underwent a process in which it 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 uh, lost its ability to divide and it became structurally and functionally specialized so the process in which a dividing cell loses its ability that is differentiation so this process will be differentiation this process will be differentiation this process will be differentiation but this differentiation has taken place earlier also okay so we know this cell is derived from this cell 
and this cell is derived from this cell okay and this cell has under underwent differentiation earlier also that means this differentiation is taking place second time that means again this process is taking place and that is why this this process will be called as redifferentiation and the cell will be called as redifferentiated cells redifferentiated cell okay so this is the these are the different terms de differentiation de differentiation and redifferentiation and cells they uh, come together to form the tissue and we, we you should know one point one point that the cells of the undifferentiated cell the undifferentiated cells they form a tissue and the tissue is called as the tissue is called as primary one degrees primary okay primary per primary meristem they form primary meristem and you can write the examples you can write the examples here okay apical meristem intercalary meristem intrafascicular chemium they are the example of what primary meristem and the cells of uh, differentiated cells and the differentiated cells they form they form primary permanent tissue they form primary permanent tissue primary permanent tissue and you can take the example of what primary xylem primary phloem and the structures like primary cortex primary pithrace etc etc okay and the cells of and the cells of what d differentiated cells they form secondary meristem and you can take the example of what interfascicular chemium okay interfascicular chemium and core chemium they are the example of secondary meristem even the wound chemium is an example of secondary meristem and the cells of uh, the cells of d differentiated cells they are they are going to form what secondary permanent tissue which tissue secondary permanent tissue okay undifferentiated cells they will form primary permanent d differentiated cells they will form secondary meristem differentiated cells they will form primary permanent re differentiated cells they will form secondary permanent okay and remember one thing during the process of differentiation there is change in there is change in what cell wall and there is change in the protoplasm okay so let me give you some example let me give you some example so when tracheid and vessels are formed and they, we know they are the component of what xylem right so when they are formed the cell wall becomes lignified they become highly lignified so i will say i will say the cell wall of what tracheid and vessel their cell wall cw is cell wall that becomes highly lignified they show lignification and this lignification it allows them to tolerate the high tension developed due to transpiration pull that allows them to tolerate high tension developed due to transpiration pull what about the protoplasm i can take two examples i can take two examples when tracheid and vessels are formed when tracheid and vessels are formed they are initially living in nature but later on later on they lose the protoplasm completely and because they lose protoplasm completely that is why they become dead okay so complete loss of protoplasm in vessel and tracheid takes place during differentiation and this lignification is also taking place during differentiation what about the second example we know the ground tissue of the leaf is mesophyll and this mesophyll are the cells which are responsible for, for performing the bulk amount of photosynthesis and to perform high amount of photosynthesis they will have they will have more number of chloroplast so there is increase in the chloroplast number there is increase in the chloroplast number so increase in the chloroplast number is an example of change in the protoplasm so you can see Change, change the change is taking place in the protoplasm the change is taking place in the cell wall also where when during the process of differentiation okay let me take check the time first okay fine so i will say differentiation is a process in which a dividing cell and a cell with no specific structure and function becomes non-dividing and becomes 
cell with specific structure and function that's the process is differentiation and the cell which we obtain is differentiated cell and during this process what happens during this process there is change in its change in the cell wall and there is change in the protoplasm and these are the examples which are given in the ncrt okay now let us try to understand about development what do you understand by development so development is a sum total of all those processes which takes place from starting from seed germination to senescence senescence is nothing but aging senescence is nothing but aging okay so all these processes or all the events which are taking place starting from germination to senescence they are collectively called as what a development okay so when the seed germinates it will produce seedling okay and the seedling will be will will undergo Go further development to form the uh, to form uh, young structures okay and the phase will be called as juvenile phase and this can also be called as vegetative phase this can be called as vegetative phase okay and later on what will happen reproductive structures will develop and they will grow they will mature and that phase is called as mature phase in case of angiosperm in the mature phase the reproductive organ that is the reproductive structures uh, that is that is the flower will produce okay and that is why for with respect to angiosperm i can call this mature phase as what flowering phase which phase flowering phase okay or i can call this as reproductive phase also then ultimately the plant will undergo age uh, undergo senescence and ultimately death will take place so all the events which are taking place starting from the germination to senescence they are <coughs> collectively called as development Okay, and this development is nothing but the growth plus differentiation. Growth plus differentiation. Okay, and there is a term which is given in the NCRT, which is plasticity, and this is somehow related to development. How? Let me explain you. Suppose there is a plant which is showing development. Okay, and during its development, the plant is capable of producing different types of structures in response to change in the phases of the plant or change in the environment so i can say whenever there is a change in the plant environment or change in the phase of the plant growth or pl plant development there will be change in the structures produced by the plant and such ability is called as plasticity okay so let me write the definition for that what is plasticity this is the ability of what plant for what to produce different types of structures different types of structures okay in response to phases of development phases of development or environment that is called as what plasticity okay and if the response is due to the phases of development that type of that type of plasticity is called as intrinsic plasticity or internal plasticity and if the the plasticity uh, is due to the environment that is called as extrinsic plasticity or environmental plasticity you can call this as environmental plasticity also okay so this is plasticity and what is the example of the structure which is formed due to different uh, different phases or environment the the example is a leaf okay and if different types of leaves are produced by the same plant by the same plant that is called as heterophily so the example of plasticity is what heterophily So what is heterophily? Heterophily is production of or formation of different types of leaves on the same plant. On the same plant, different leaves are pr produced. Okay, so I can say heterophily is production of what? Different leaves, different types of leaves on same plant. Okay, 
with respect to different environments or with respect to different phases of development that is called as heterophily and the examples are the examples are what where, where do we find the heterophily we find it in plants like carrot okay coriander where carrot coriander larkspur buttercup so these are the plants where different types of leaves are produced different types of leaves are produced and remember one thing remember one thing in these three plants that is carrot coriander and larkspur the different types of leaves uh, leaves are produced due to different phases of development and and that is why i will say they show intrinsic plasticity whereas the buttercup in buttercup the formation of different types of leaves that is heterophily is not due to is not due to uh, different phases of development but due to environment in terrestrial habitat it will produce different uh, one type of leaf and in water or aquatic environment it will produce other type of leaf so i will say this is an example of what in buttercup which, which type of plasticity is produced uh, is observed i will say uh, extrinsic or environmental plasticity is observed extrinsic or environmental plasticity is observed okay so this was about plasticity i repeat during development during development of a plant if the phase of the development change or if the environment change what happens the plant will respond by producing different types of structures and the example is production of different types of leaves and that is called as heterophily and if if the uh, the if the response is due to different phases of development you call that as intrinsic if it is due to different uh, environment environment or habitat i call this as extrinsic or environmental plasticity now let us try to understand the factors which affect development all those factors which affect growth they will affect the development why because development is development is nothing but growth plus differences so whatever factors affect growth they will also affect the development okay and all those factors which affect development they are categorized into two groups what are those one is extrinsic factors or external factors and second is intrinsic factors or plant factors and what are the examples of extrinsic factors light nutrient water temperature etc etc and the intrinsic factors they are classified into two groups if the factor is present within the cell the factors are said to be the, the intracellular and the example is genes the gen are genetic okay ge genetic factors you can say so there are different types of genes which are going to control the plant growth okay and what about uh, the other factor the other factor is present outside the cell and between the cells and they are said to be intercellular and the example is plant hormones the example is plant hormones so in this chapter we are not going to discuss about the genes which are going to control the development okay we have discussed how these extrinsic factors they affect the growth so the, the and uh, growth and if these factors affect the growth that means they are affecting the development and in this chapter we will also talk about the plant hormones which are going to control the or affect the plant development okay so let us discuss them one by one then so let us first talk about the plant hormones okay so the plant hormones they are responsible for regulating the different uh, uh, their response they are going to uh, regulate the plant growth some will promote the plant growth and some will inhibit the plant growth and accordingly they are called uh, they are named named as plant or, or growth promoters or growth inhibitors okay let me repeat all the plant hormones they are not responsible for promoting the growth some will promote some will inhibit those hormones which promote growth they are said to be growth promoters those which inhibit the growth they are said to be growth inhibitors okay and the plant hormones are of various types but the main main, main types are auxin gibberellin cytokine abscisic acid and ethylene and among these five the three hormones that is the auxin gibberellin and cytokine they are growth promoting hormones and ethylene and abscisic acid they are growth inhibitor in, in, inhibiting hormones but remember one thing ethylene has the the effect of what 
growth promoter and growth inhibitor but largely it is it, it has growth inhibitory effect okay and what about this uh, feature whatever uh, what about the feature of this plant hormones let me tell you one by one but before that let me drink some water okay let me first write and after that i will drink water so what about plant hormones so these plant hormones are also called as they are also called as cd is called okay so they are also called as plant growth regulators why because they regulate why because they regulate plant growth that is why they are called as plant growth regulators okay and they are also called as plant growth substances and they are also called as phyto hormones phyto means plant so hormones found in plants they are said to be phyto hormones so these are the different names of plant growth hormones okay and what about the features they are small in size they are not large molecules they are small small molecules and they are simple compounds they are not chemically comp complex they are chemically very simple in nature and they are of different chemical nature so i will say chemically they are diverse that means all, all the plant hormones they are of not chemically similar type they are of different so, so i will say they are chemically diverse they are chemically diverse let me give you some examples here okay so if i take the example of what auxin okay so the auxin is basically made of indolic compounds so this is indo made of indolic compounds and the example is indolacetic acid indolacetic acid okay what about cytokinin cytokinin you can take the example of what so let me write here indolacetic acid or indolbutyric acid okay what about cytokinin the cytokinin are basically derivative of purine derivative of purine or and the purine which i take is adenine okay and the example is the example is kinetin and kinetin kinetin is a cytokinin and this kinetin is a cytokinin okay what about gibberellin gibberellin is also known as gibberellic acid okay and this is a and this is chemically terpene okay what about abscisic acid abscisic acid is derived from carotenoid so i will say it is carotenoid derivative okay and the last one is ethylene and this ethylene basically gas so you can clearly see that you can clearly see that different hormones they are made of different types of chemicals and that is why we, we say that they are chemically diverse okay and they are produced at certain locations and they are transported to the site of their action so i will say they are they are produced or i can say they are transported from site of production or you can write synthesis to site of direction direction okay so this was about phyto hormones this was about the introduction of phyto hormones so how this these phyto hormones were discovered let me tell you one by one so all the five major plant hormones all the five major plant hormones they were discovered accidentally accidentally by different scientists the first plant hormone which was discovered by uh, which was discovered was auxin so i will say auxin was the first hormone first plant hormone or you can say plant growth regulators pgr to be discovered the first plant hormone to be discovered 
was what was auxin and this was first isolated it was first isolated from where from the from human urine and if this auxin is found in the human urine that means i can say urine is not metabolized in our body okay so why this auxin is found in the human urine because auxin is not metabolized and for the first time the auxin was not isolated from any plant but it was isolated from the human urine okay and this auxin was discovered for the discovery of auxin you should remember about three scientists three scientists and who were they let me tell you one by one okay so the first scientist the first two scientists were charles darwin and francis darwin charles darwin and francis darwin okay charles darwin was father and francis darwin was his son okay so these two scientists these two scientists they they performed an experiment on the by taking the coleoptile of what coleoptile of coleoptile of canary grass okay so they took coleoptile of canary grass and they performed uh, and they studied the phototropism they studied the phototropism so they took coleoptile of canary grass and they st studied phototropism they studied phototropism and while they studied phototropism they used they used unilateral light they used unilateral light so by providing unilateral light they studied the phototropism in the coleoptile of canary grass okay so what do you understand by this let me try to explain them okay so suppose this is the coleoptile so suppose this is the coleoptile okay and they they provided light to the tip of this coleoptile from one direction so from one direction they provided light so i will say that the light provided was unilateral side is lateral uni means one from one direction they provided light and after some time they observed that they observed that this coleoptile bent towards the side from where the light was provided okay so i can write uh, i can draw the diagram like this so it bent towards the side from where the light was supplied okay so they observed like this okay so they observed like this and when they covered this one with when they covered the tip of the coleoptile with opaque covering this they observed there was no bending and when they covered this the tip of the coleoptile with transparent covering they observed there was there was bending there was bending just like the normal one okay and from that they concluded that okay at the tip of the coleoptile at the tip of the coleoptile some substance must be produced which which will be uh, which will be transmitted to the other parts of the coleoptile and that will be responsible for bending of the uh, what bending of the entire coleoptile okay and they they said that chemical as transmittable in influence transmittable influence and later on it was found that the transmittable influence was nothing but the uh, auxin that was nothing but the auxin okay so what did they say they said at the tip of the coleoptile they said that at the tip of coleoptile some chemical is produced and and they call that chemical as what they call that chemical as transmittable influence okay and that transmittable influence causes the bending of bending of what entire coleoptile bending of entire coleoptile okay what about the other scientist the other scientist was f w went okay and he he isolated he was the first person to isolate auxin and he isolated auxin not from canary grass coleoptile but he isolated from the what coleoptile of oat plant which plant oat plant so i will write he he was the first to isolate auxin from what
कोलियोप्टाइल ऑफ ओट प्लांट एंड दिस ओट प्लांट इज साइंटिफिकली कॉल एज एवेना वट यू कॉल दिस एज एवेना ओके सो आई विल से डाविन एंड डाविन दे परफॉर्म एक्सपेरिमेंट विद द कोलियोप्टाइल ऑफ वट कैनोग्रास विद द कोलियोप्टाइल ऑफ कैनोग्रास एंड एफ डब्ल्यू वेंट ही परफॉर्म एक्सपेरिमेंट विद वट कोलियोप्टाइल ऑफ वट ओट प्लांट ओट प्लांट नाउ वट अबाउट द डिस्कवरी ऑफ एंड लेट मी टेल यू वन थिंग हाउ दिस बेंडिंग टेक्स प्लेस ओके सो सो सपोज सपोज दिस इज द कोलियोप्टाइल सपोज दिस इज द कोलियोप्टाइल ओके एंड सपोज यू प्रोवाइड लाइट टू द टिप ऑफ दिस कोलियोप्टाइल सो दिस इज द कोलियोप्टाइल ओके एंड आफ्टर वेन यू प्रोवाइड लाइट to this when you provide light to this tip of the coleoptile what will happen at the tip there will be synthesis of oxygen there will be synthesis of oxygen so suppose these are the oxygen molecules suppose these are the oxygens okay so i will say when you eliminate the coleoptile tip with the light what happens at the tip oxygen is produced and once the oxygen is produced what happens the oxygens they will be transported to this shaded side okay so this this is the side where you had provided the light okay now later on what is going to happen so this is the coleoptile this is the coleoptile okay and these are the oxygen molecules now these oxygen molecules will be transported to the side where uh, where there is no light there is no light okay that means to the shaded side they will be transported so on this side on this side you have provided light okay and this side is the shaded side so on this shaded side they will be transported okay so you can see there is differential distribution of oxygen there is differential dif distribution of oxygen and the oxygen is responsible for cell elongation and cell division so this <coughs> the cells which are present in this area they will elongate and they will divide more as compared to the cells present in this area and that is why the growth will be more on this side and the growth will be less on this side this side growth will be less this side growth will be more okay and why because the growth uh, the growth is uh, the growth uh, or i will say the division cell, cell elongation or the cell division is due to auxin and because you can see in this area oxygen is more but in this area oxygen is less or absent that is why i can say there is differential distribution of oxygen and this dis differential dif distribution of oxygen will cause differential growth of the coleoptile so in this area growth will be more in this area growth will be less okay and because of the dif differential growth of the coleoptile there will be bending of the coleoptile towards the towards this end so i will say ultimately it will undergo bending just a minute it is bending like this okay so these are the oxygens okay so i can say so this is the bending bending of coleoptile okay and this bending of coleoptile was due to what differential growth okay on the shaded side growth was more on the uh, lighted side the growth was less okay and why this uh, the growth was differential due to differential distribution of oxygen due to differential distribution of oxygen okay so this was about the uh, the, the actual explanation of what actual ex explanation of how the bending takes place how the bending takes place okay so what are these these are nothing but the oxygen molecules now now what about gibberellin it was a matter of disease which uh, in the japan okay so let me take uh, let me explain that part so in japan in japan bacon disease which disease bacon disease which is also known as 
foolish seedling disease. Okay, this disease was observed or found in the rice plant. In which plant? Rice plant. Okay, so I can say in Japan, the rice plant had backend disease. Okay, backend disease, and they they some sign and this backend disease, this backend disease is due to this backend disease in the rice is due to a fungus. And what is that fungus? The fungus is Gibberella. Fusicoroi. What is that? Uh, what is that fungus? The fungus is Gibberella fusicoroi. Okay, one scientist was there, and the scientist was Kurosawa. 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 Okay, what did he do? Suppose, suppose this is the fungus. Suppose this is the fungus, okay, and the fungus was Gibberella fusicoroi, and he extracted something from the fungus, okay. So suppose, suppose this is the extract from the fungus. This is fungal extract. This is fungal extract, okay. So let me write that part. This is fungal extract, and this fungal extract was actually obtained from Gibberella fusicoroi, which fungus Gibberella fusicoroi, okay. And suppose, suppose this is the normal or healthy rice plant this is the healthy rice plant okay and kurosawa he infected this healthy rice plant this is healthy rice plant this is healthy rice plant okay and he infected this healthy rice plant with the fungal extract which was obtained from the gibberella fusicoroi and later on when he left it as it is what he observed that in the same in the healthy in the healthy rice plant in the healthy rice plant the symptoms of bacon disease appeared what appeared the symptoms of bacon disease appeared so i will say this is the rice plant with symptoms of bacon disease Symptoms of bacon disease. Actu and what is this? This is the fungal extract, and this fungal extract had gibberellin. This fungal extract had gibberellin. Okay, so this is how the discovery of gibberellin was uh, was uh, had uh, taken place. Now, what about cytokinin? So for cytokinin, I will talk about one scientist, and the scientist was Skug. Okay, so it was Skug and his teammate. So I will say Skug et al. Cook and his teammate, teammate, they performed an experiment. In that experiment, what did they take? Uh, what did they do? They had taken, they had taken one culture medium. So this is the culture medium. Okay, and in the culture medium, they took, they took the coleoptera. Sorry, the they took internode of the. So suppose this is the internode. This is the internode of what? Sugar cane. This is the segment. This is the segment. No, no, this is the segment of uh, internode of sugarcane. Okay, and in this culture medium, in this culture medium, they had provided auxin. They had provided auxin, and this internode segment of the this is the internode segment of sugarcane, and this this was treated as explant. Okay, this was the explant, and this explant was nothing but the well, th this was nothing but the segment of internode of which plant sugarcane so not sugarcane i'm very sorry tobacco very sorry very sorry tobacco which plant tobacco okay and they found that there was no formation of callus no callus was formation was formed so no callus formation so let me repeat when when skook and his teammates they supplied auxin in the culture medium to the explant they found there was no callus formation okay but but later on what did they do so they they took the culture medium here 
okay and in this culture medium again they took the explant and the explant was the segment of what the explant was the segment of just a minute segment of internode of tobacco plant internode of tobacco plant okay and in this case they supplied auxin they supplied auxin and along with supply along with auxin they also supplied something suppose b they supplied b okay and they found that they found that here what happened here callus was formed what was formed callus was formed so suppose this is the callus this is the callus so here what happened callus was formed callus formation took place callus formation took place when auxin alone was provided there was no callus formation but when auxin along with b was provided there was formation of callus there was formation of callus and the b was any of the following the b was any of the following it could be yeast extract it could be yeast yeast extract or it could be extract of vascular tissue so i can say vascular tissue extract or it could be the dna from the head sperm okay so i can say and the dna was autoclaved that means that was sterilized i will say that that was autoclaved dna of what herring sperm or it could be it could be coconut milk it could be coconut milk okay so among these four any one of the following when was when the, any one of the following was supplied along with the auxin what happened callus was formed so you may ask me sir what is callus callus is basically mass of undifferentiated unorganized cells so when i say callus is formed that means new cells are formed and when new cells are formed that means there is cell division is taking place what is taking place cell division is taking place and in, if there is cell division that means there is cytokinesis that means any of these following com compounds they are promoting cytokinesis they are promoting cytokinesis callus is mass of unorganized undifferentiated cells so when callus is formed that means new cells are formed and new cells are formed that means cell division is taking place okay so these chemicals and uh, these chemicals they are responsible for inducing this chemi not chemicals these substances they are responsible for inducing cell division cytokinesis and those uh, chemicals they are nothing but the cytokine they are nothing but the cytokine okay so what is callus let me write that part here okay callus is mass of unorganized and undifferentiated cells that is callus okay and all these chemicals they are because they are responsible for because they are responsible for inducing or promoting the cytokinin or the cell division that is why they are called as cytokinin they are called as cytokinin okay and and it was it was Cook and miller it was Cook and miller who isolated who isolated cytokinin who isolated cytokinin so i will write they were the scientists to isolate cytokinin and they coined the term they coined the term kinetin they coined the term kinetin okay other scientists gave the term cytokinin the other terms the other scientists they coined the term cytokinin okay so what is cytokinin cytokinin is basically cell division promoting uh, hormone or i can say cytokinin promoting this is not cytokinin this is cytokinesis promoting hormone cytokinesis promoting hormone cytokinesis is nothing but the division of cytoplasm okay so this is how the uh, cytokinin was discovered what about abscisic acid so it was it was 
मिड नाइनटीन सिक्सटीज इट वॉज मिड नाइनटीन सिक्सटीज तो इन मिड नाइनटीन सिक्सटीज थ्री डिफरेंट रिसर्चर्स दे स्टडीड दे आइसोलेटेड एंड दे कैरेक्टराइज सर्टन केमिकल्स विच हैड इनहिबिटरी इफेक्ट ऑन द प्लांट प्लांट ग्रोथ एंड डेवलपमेंट and they named them differently they named them them differently so let me write that part in mid 1960s three different three different researchers they independently they independently isolated and characterized substances which had which had inhibitory effect inhibitory effect for plant growth and development okay and they named them and they named them and they named them as dormin okay other scientists name name that as other other scientists name that as abscisson b and inhibitor second sorry abscisson second abscisson second and inhibitor inhibitor b okay so these are the different names which was given by three different scientists different researchers and later on later on it was found that these three chemicals these three chemicals they are not chemically different they are chemically same so i will say they are actually they were found to be chemically same and now they are called as abscisic acid now they are called as abscisic acid so three different scientists at three different places they done the research okay they did the research okay and they found some chemicals and they they observed they they found that the chemical had some inhibitory effect to plant growth and development and they named them differently okay later on it was found that all the different different chemicals which were uh, isolated and characterized by different scientists independently they were chemically same and later on they were called as called as abscisic acid what about the other hormone the last hormone ethylene so ethylene for ethylene you should remember the name of but remember the name of cousin so it was cousin who discovered ethylene okay so suppose suppose these are the suppose these are the ripened oranges suppose these are the ripened oranges okay so these are the ripened oranges so suppose these are ripened oranges okay so these are ripened oranges okay and suppose suppose okay uh suppose uh sorry i don't know how to draw the diagram okay okay properly so i can write here i can write here uh sorry my diagram is very bad my diagram is very bad okay so i let me write here so suppose here i am having a green banana here i am having green banana okay so he observed that when he kept the green banana near the ripened oranges what he observed he observed that this green banana they ripened they ripened so they he ultimately got the ripened banana he got the ripened banana so he he thought he thought and he suggested that certain chemicals certain chemicals must have evolved uh, released must have released from the from the ripened oranges okay so these are the chemicals which have 
release which are re which are released from the ripened oranges okay and these chemicals are volatile in nature so some volatile substances got released from the ripened oranges and they they came to the green banana okay they affected the green banana and they caused the ripening of the banana and later on it was found that this volatile substance was nothing but the ethylene ethylene and whenever fruit ripening is there you have to remember about ethylene the main effect of the ethylene is fruit ripening what fruit ripening fine so this was about the discovery of what ethylene so what about the physiological roles of different plant growth regulators plant hormones before that let me drink some water then i will explain you one by one okay so let's talk about the physiological roles of different plant growth regulators but before that let me tell you uh, let me uh, do some one correction okay so the example of plasticity i have done a mistake i have committed a mistake so i have to correct that fast first okay so so it was not uh, carrot it was cotton okay so please do that uh, correction okay so the example of Interesting plasticity are cotton, coriander, and larkspur, not carrot. It is, it is, it was uh, cotton. Okay, so please do that correction. Now, <clears throat> now let us try to understand about what the diff physiological roles of different plant growth regulators. Okay, so the first hormone which we are going to discuss is auxin. So this was first isolated from the human urine. And as I have already told you that why do why do we find this in human urine? Because this is not metabolized uh, metabolized in our body, okay. And this auxin can be natural or can be synthetic. What do you understand by natural and synthetic? If the hormone is naturally found in the plant, that is natural. If it is not found in the plant but synthesized in the lab, that is called as synthetic or artificial. So the examples you have to remember the examples of natural auxins are IAA indole acetic acid, IBA indole butyric acid, NA naphthalene acetic acid, and 2,4-D. Okay, so these are the examples of what synthetic auxins. Okay, <clears throat> so what are the roles then? So if you cut a stem and if you want to use that cut stem to propagate the plant, that it means if you want to perform the vegetative propagation by the process of cutting. You have to initiate the rooting first okay so if you want to initiate the rooting then you have to apply the cut part of the stem with the auxin and remember one thing the auxin which we apply or provide to the cut part of the stem should be dilute why because high concentration of auxin will inhibit the formation of root so at low concentration or i can say dilute auxin will promote the root initiation in stem cutting okay so in horticulture we use this auxin to initiate the stem rooting in the stem cutting okay so the the important part you have to remember is the auxin supplied the auxin provided must be dilute must be in the form of dilute con condition okay if it is concentrated if it is concentrated then it will inhibit it it will inhibit the root initiation then if we want to promote the flowering in pineapple we can we can apply or we can uh, uh, we can apply the auxin to the pineapple so it will promote the flowering it is responsible for promoting anti abscission abscission means falling down or uh, falling down or the dropping dropping of different structures okay so it is anti abscission that means it it inhibits the it prevents the inhibition so do you think that it is going to inhibit the or prevent the inhibition of all types of structures no it it is anti abscission in nature only with respect to with respect to young structures 
not old or senescent structures okay so only with respect to young structures and these structures can be these structures can be leaves these structures can be flowers okay or these structures can be fruits also so if the structures are young then only then only their abscission will be inhibited by the auxin but but if the structures are old or senescent the auxin is going to promote the abscission it is going to promote the abscission okay so let me write that part here okay note auxin it promotes abscission of old structures old structures okay if the structures are young its abscission is inhibited or prevented by auxin but if they are old then the structures will be the, their abscission will be promoted by the auxin okay then this auxin is responsible for promoting apical dominance so what do you understand by apical dominance let me explain that part here okay so suppose suppose this is a plant suppose this is a plant okay and this plant will have a number of buds okay so suppose suppose this is one bud okay suppose this is another bird okay and suppose this is another bird so these are the different birds okay and here i am having the leaf okay so these are the leaves okay so i can write this this one as axillary bird axillary bird or and this axillary bird is also called as lateral bird lateral bird okay and this one is apical bird shoot apical bird shoot apical bird okay so now what is going to happen what is going to happen now in this in this in this apical bird or uh, apical bird what will happen there is synthesis of auxin and this auxin will travel towards this lateral axillary buds and it will inhibit the growth of the axillary buds okay so i can say i can say here that here what is happening auxin is synthesized okay and this auxin will uh, auxin will travel this way okay it will it will come and act on the uh, act on the axillary bud okay so which one auxin so these are the auxins okay so the auxin is going to act on the lateral buds and due to the auxin the lateral bud will uh, the growth of the uh, lateral bird bird will be inhibited will be inhibited okay so i can write here that auxin it promotes the auxin promotes growth of apical bird growth of apical bird but but the auxin inhibits or prevents growth of lateral bud growth of lateral bud okay and the phenomenon in which the in the presence of apical bud the lateral bud growth is inhibited that phenomenon is known as apical dominance what is apical dominance the inhibition of growth of the lateral buds in the presence of apical bud is known as is known as apical dominance and actually which chemical is responsible it is the auxin which is synthesized in the apical bud okay so let me write that part here okay so this is apical dominance is basically inhibition of growth of lateral bud in the presence of in the presence of apical bird in the presence of apical bird okay this is called as word apical dominance now what about part uh, the other function this auxin is responsible for inducing parthenocarpy in tomato okay so what is parthenocarpy parthenocarpy is a process in which seedless fruits are produced seedless fruits are produced okay so we can if we if we uh, treat the uh, treat the tomato plant with the auxin then seedless fruit or tomato we can obtain this is this 
दिस ऑक्सीजन इज ऑल्सो यूज एज हर्बी साइड और वीडे साइड ओके हर्बी साइड मीन्स एनी थिंग विच किल्स दी हर्ब और एनी थिंग विच किल्स दी वीड इज नॉन एज वीडे साइड ओके एंड फॉर दिस विच वन डू वी यूज वी यूज दी टू फोर डी विच वन टू फोर डी एंड दिस वॉज यूज इन दी वियतनाम वॉर दिस वॉज यूज इन वियतनाम वॉर एंड रिमेम्बर वन थिंग द वीड कैन बी कैन बी ऑफ डायकॉट और मोनोकॉट बट रिमेम्बर दिस इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट दैट दिस दिस टू फोर डी और दी ऑक्सीजन is going to kill <coughs> the dicot not the monocot it is going to kill the dicot not the monocot so i will say this is effective this is effective only against dicots only against dicots not monocots only against dicots not monocots this is very very important okay and this oxygen is responsible for promoting xylem differences and it helps in cell division so these are the different functions of oxygen so what are the different roles of the oxygen oxygen it it is it uh, it promotes root initiation in stem cutting it promotes flowering in pineapple it is responsible for preventing the abscission of young structures and it is responsible for promoting the apical dominance it it induces parthenocarpy in tomato it it is used as herbicide or weedicide only for dicots not monocots okay and it it induces or it helps in xylem differentiation it helps in cell division okay now what about the role of gibberellin okay gibberellin is acidic in nature more than 100 different types of gibberellic acids or gibberellin have been isolated so far identified so far and the one of the most studied and the uh, first discovered gib gibberellin was gibberellic acid 3 okay so ga3 ga3 was uh, is one of the first discovered this is one of the first discovered and most studied gibberellin so i will say this is one of the most studied and first discovered gibberellin or i can say gibberellic acid okay so this gibberellin has different functions so it is responsible for increasing the length of grape stalk so there will be more yield of the grape it is also responsible for elongating the apple and it it is responsible for improvising the shape of the apple it is responsible for increasing the length of the internode in case of sugarcane and because it increases the length of the sugarcane the, so the it uh, so so the uh, sugar content in the sugar cane will now increase and i can say and that is why i can say this oxygen so this gibberellin is responsible for increasing the yield of the sugar cane and it, it can increase the yield up to 20 tons per acre it is it can in increase yield up to 20 tons per acre okay now this is also responsible for bolting effect okay and in bolting effect what happens in plant in plants like a beet and cabbage what happens the length of the internode is highly reduced highly reduced okay and that is why it appears as if all the leaves they have developed from the same point but actually different leaves they develop from different points and the points are basically nodes okay why does this appear so because the length of internode is very very small very very reduced so if you treat that plant with gibberellin what will happen the length of the internode will increase now and because of that now you can observe that okay different leaves they have developed from the different nodes okay and that process and and that phenomenon is known as what bolting effect so why there is bolting effect due to increase in the length of internode and how the internode uh, because of what the internode length increases because of the application of gibberellin because of the application of gibberellin okay so it is responsible for in, uh, elongating the length of the internode okay and remember one thing if you if you provide if you provide it let me ask you one question so suppose suppose this is a dwarf plant okay and for dwarf plant let me write small t and small t and if you treat this if you treat this plant with gibberellin what will happen this plant will become tall in now okay so this will become tall so this is dwarf plant 
and when in, when you treated this with gibberellin what happened this became tall and if you allow selfing if you allow selfing in this plant which type of plant you are going to get tall plant dwarf plant or both take a pause and think and then you answer and do not forget to mention the answer okay so the answer will be dwarf only dwarf plant will be obtained okay dwarf plant will be obtained not tall plant so dwarf plant will be obtained why because application of the gibberellin it changes the phenotype not the genotype because in this plant it is no doubt tall but the genotype is dwarf genotype is dwarf G sorry not dwarf genotype is small t and small t and because the genotype has not changed that is why if we perform the selfing in this plant then what will happen only dwarf plant will be produced okay the dwarf plant is going to produce okay so i can say uh, you can write this point th here that that gibberellin it affects or it changes you can say affects or changes phenotype but not genotype but not genotype okay this is responsible for delay senescence okay and that is why it can increase the uh, increase the what uh, increase the period for which the plant organs uh, the or especially the flowers or fruits can be attached or uh, can be remain on uh, can remain on the plant and so uh, i can say this this uh, this um, increases the market period this increases the market period and uh, in case of conifers the gibberellin is responsible for early seed production it is responsible for early seed production it hastens the maturity period and because it hastens the maturity periods maturity period that is why the seed will be produced early the seed will be produced early where in the conifers which is an example of what group of gymnosperms okay now what about the functions of cytokine the cytokine is responsible for production of new leaves okay and in the leaves there is mesophyll cells okay and in the mesophyll cells the cytokine is responsible for producing more number of chloroplast and it is also responsible for formation of lateral shoots and adventitious shoot formation okay so these are the th this is the function of what cytokine so what about the other function this overcomes apical dominance so what do you understand by overcoming of apical dominance in this case even in the presence of apical bud the lateral bud will grow and when the lateral bud grow, grows lateral branches will be formed okay so let me draw the diagram here okay so suppose suppose this is the suppose this is the plant okay and suppose suppose this is the apical bud okay and suppose okay and let me draw here some lateral birds okay some lateral birds so suppose this is one lateral bird okay so this is suppose this is one lateral bird okay and this is another lateral bird now what is going to happen these lateral birds will grow even in the presence of what apical bird even in the presence of apical bird just a minute so here the lateral bud which was present it it grew and it formed lateral branches it formed lateral branches okay so these are the leaves okay so these are the lateral branches these are lateral branches okay and here okay these are the 
lateral lateral buds so these are lateral buds and these are lateral branches and this lateral branches they it developed from what lateral bud it developed from lateral bud so here you can see the the apical bud is present but still in the presence of apical bud what is happening the the lateral bud is growing and it, it is forming lateral branches so the phenomenon in which even in the presence of apical bud if the lateral br branches they grow that is called as overcoming of apical dominance and this is due to the cytokinin this is due to the cytokinin so i can write here what is of okay so and what about the other function this cytokinin is responsible for mobilizing the nutrient which helps in the delay leaf senescence okay so what are the different functions let me repeat okay this is nothing but you have to remember uh, you have to learn okay this is very simple it helps in the production of new leaves more number of chloroplast in the mesophyll cells of the leaf it is responsible for formation of lateral shoot and it is responsible for formation of adventitious shoot okay this overcomes apical dominance apical dominance is overcome by what overcome by cytokinin it is promoted by auxin this uh, cytokinin helps in nutrient mobilization okay and uh, and uh, because of nutrient mobilization there will be delay in the leaf senescence and very important point i am going to tell please watch this carefully okay so if here i am writing okay so if the amount of auxin is equals to amount of cytokinin then what will happen in a culture medium in a culture medium if the amount of auxin which is provided is equals to the amount of cytokinin then in that case the explant will form the callus the explant will form the callus so it induces callus formation i repeat in a culture medium if you provide if you supply both auxin and cytokinin then and if their amount is same then then the explant will form the callus but but if the amount of auxin is more as compared to cytokinin then what will happen it will promote the formation of root and the root which is formed here is not from the radical so this will be called as adventitious root so this promotes formation of adventitious root okay so higher amount of auxin along with less amount of cytokinin it promotes it promotes root formation and if the amount of auxin is less than the amount of cytokinin in the culture medium then what will happen the callus will form the shoot and the shoot is not formed from the plumule here and that is why this shoot will be adventitious shoot which shoot adventitious shoot so here you can clearly see higher amount of cytokinin promotes formation of adventitious shoot higher amount of auxin promotes the formation of adventitious shoot this is very very important okay and that is why here i have written adventitious shoot formation is promoted by cytokinin okay now let us talk about the function of ethylene ethylene promotes senescence and abscission of what different organs like leaf and flowers it it is responsible for fruit ripening so if you want to fasten or speed up the fruit ripening you can supply the ethylene you can treat with uh, ethylene and during fruit ripening this ethylene increases the rate of respiration under normal conditions the rate of respiration is low but when the fruit ripens during that time the rate of respiration becomes very high and that high in a uh, higher rate of respiration during fruit ripening is called as respiratory climatic and this is very very important so who is responsible for respiratory climatic it is ethylene and what is this higher rate of respiration during fruit ripening that is respiratory climatic okay and this ethylene is responsible for breaking the dormancy dormancy of what the dormancy and bud dormancy the dormancy is uh, broken in plants like peanut and bud dormancy is broken in plants like potato so if you take a potato okay so we know potato is, a, a, is is an example of stem tuber in which eye is present and in eye there will be axillary bud okay and if the axillary bud is not growing that means it is in dormant condition so now if you treat it with the ethylene then the axillary bud will grow and it will develop the new plant 
okay so the dormancy can be broken and uh, if the it, if the uh, bud is growing that means it is sprouting it is sprouting okay now in case of pineapple in case of pineapple if you treat this pineapple with the ethylene then what will happen it will initiate flowering and it will synchronize the fruit set okay and in mango this ethylene is responsible for initiating the flowering and in case of cucumber it 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 increases the production of female flowers it increases the production of female flowers see the cucumber is diocese in nature that means one plant will have only male flowers and another plant will have only female flowers okay so if a plant is having only female flowers so uh, the plant having male flowers will not produce the fruit why because fruit develops from the car uh, ovary and ovary is present in the carpel and carpel is a part of female flower so if the plant is having only male flowers not female flowers the plant will not produce any fruit but if the plant has female flowers carpel is present and carpel is present means ovary is present ovary is present means fruit will develop so if you treat a plant with ethylene it will produce and which plant cucumber plant if you treat this uh, if you treat a cucumber plant with the ethylene supply ethylene more uh, more to the cucumber plant more number of female flowers will produce and if there is more number of female flowers more fruits will be produced okay so i can say it will increase the it will so this ethylene this ethylene is responsible for increase in the yield the yield will increase the yield will increase okay now what about the other functions we know rice is rice is grown in water rich soil okay and uh, when rice is grown the uh, the root part of the root part and the lower part of the stem is covered by or submerged in the water okay and if the if the entire entire rice plant is submerged is submerged in the in the water then what will happen the plant will get decomposed so to avoid this the stem the stem becomes elongated or the petiole of the leaf gets elongated and this is due to the ethylene so because of the elongation of the stem uh, stem specifically the internode or the petiole the leaves and the other parts of the plant they remain above the they remain above the above the water surface and that is why they do not get decomposed they do not get decomposed okay and what about uh, the other function it hastens that means this ethylene speeds up the fruit ripening in tomatoes and ap apples and it it accelerates the absorption of flowers and fruits and that is why uh, the there will be more free space for development of uh, for formation of new plant organs okay so suppose suppose this is this is the plant this is the plant okay and suppose these are the fruits these are the fruits okay so for formation of new fruit i require space i require space okay so what is going to happen now is see if now now so these are the fruits these are the fruits okay so if these fruits if these fruits they undergo abscission they fall down then the space is available now so now what will happen the fruits will develop the fruits will develop here okay so the process in which the space is the space is the space is provided for new fruits or new structures or new flowers to develop that process is called as thinning that is called as thinning okay and because because this ethylene is responsible for accelerating the abscission of flowers and fruits that is why more it provides it it provides more space for development of more flowers and uh, more new flowers and fruits and this is called as thinning okay so this thinning is observed in case of cotton cherry and walnut okay and this ethylene is also responsible for what this is responsible for triple response and this triple response is observed in the dicot seedling where do you find this you find this in dicot seedling where in the dicot seedling okay so what what is triple response it includes three different events one is formation of apical hook second is horizontal growth of seedling and third is swelling of the axis these three are collectively called as triple response and these are <coughs> sorry observed in the dicot seedling and this is and this triple response is due to the application of what application of ethylene so these are the different physiological roles of the ethylene 
what about the physiological role of uh, abscisic acid this abscisic acid is responsible for closing this stomata closing this stomata okay and and it promotes this seed dormancy okay and it increases the tolerance of plant against different stressful conditions and because this abscisic acid is responsible for uh, increasing the tolerance of the plant under different stressful conditions that is why we call this as stress stress hormone which one stress hormone okay now let us try to understand different uh, other topics like photoperiodism okay then one lesson and we will also talk about the dormancy so these three topics are left let me check the time then i will teach okay the time is 1 hour 55 minutes okay no problem so in case of angiosperms we know flower is present and this flowering is dip may be dependent on the duration of light period and dark period and it also may be dip and it may be dependent on the low temperature so if the flowering is dependent on the duration of the light and darkness that is known as photoperiodism what do you call that as photoperiodism so what is photoperiodism this is the dependence of the flower flowering on what on duration of what photo period photo period means the time period for which you provide the light to the plant and it also depends on the dark period dark period means the time period for which the duration for which we you keep the plant in darkness okay so both photo period and dark period they are equally important they are equally important for for photoperiodism that is flowering and this flowering is this photo period uh, so this photo period is not observed in all angiosperms so i will say this is not observed or i can say this is observed in some angiosperms not all angiosperms not all angiosperms okay and uh, and uh, when i talk about this photoperiodism photoperiodism uh, we uh, we must know about three different things okay what are those let me tell you one by one so in photoperiodism there are different things which are involved and the first one is the structure the first one is the structure okay so i will say the structure involved in photoperiodism the structure involved in photoperiodism and the structure which is involved in the photoperiodism is the leaf okay which type of leaf mature leaf so mature leaves mature leaves they are involved in photoperiodism so how they are involved in photoperiodism let me explain you okay so suppose suppose this is the plant this is the plant which shows photoperiodism okay and this is the leaf and which leaf this is mature leaf this is mature leaf and this is the shoe typical meristem this is shoe typical meristem okay so this is shoot apical meristem okay this is mature leaf and this mature leaf this receives this receives the stimulus of what photo period and dark period okay so this mature leaf is, is going to perceive what photo period and dark period and in response to that this mature leaf will produce certain hormones certain chemicals so suppose these are the chemicals these are the chemicals and these chemicals are not yet isolated and that is why they are called as hypothetical and they are they are believed to be hormones okay now these hormones will be exported from this leaf and they will be transported to the shoe typical meristem they will be transported to this shoe typical meristem so they will reach here okay they will reach here okay so what is happening here here the shoe uh, the chemicals they are transported from the mature leaf they are from the mature leaf to the shoe typical meristem okay so this is the export this is the 
export of the chemical export of chemical and this these chemicals are nothing but the fluorogen they are nothing but the fluorogen so what is fluorogen fluorogen is basically fluorogen is basically what hormone associated with flowering photopetism and this is because 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 this is not yet isolated that is why this is hypothetical why this is hypothetical Be because this is not isolated yet okay and when this when this uh, fluorogen they get transported to the shoot apical meristem now these hormones they will cause the transformation of this shoot apical meristem and this shoot apical meristem will be transformed okay so this shoot apical meristem now the shoot apical meristem will be transformed to form the floral meristem it will form the floral meristem okay and this floral meristem will form a structure called as floral primordium and this floral pri primordium will develop to form the floral bud and this floral bud will form the flower later on that means ultimately ultimately the florigen ultimately the florigen is responsible for formation of what flower from where from the shoot apical meristem shoot apical meristem okay so the structure which is involved is the mature leaf and its function is to perceive the photo period and dark period and what is uh, the second component is the florigen this is an hormone which is responsible for what conversion of the shoot apical meristem to the floral meristem which will ultimately form the flower what about the third component what about the third component okay so the third co second component was the second component was hormone and the hormone it was florigen the hormone is florigen the hormone is florigen okay this is not yet isolated that is why this is hypothetical produced in the mature leaf exported to the shoot apical meristem okay what about the third component the third component is the pigment third component pigment and this pigment this pigment is phytochrome this pigment is phytochrome and this phytochrome exists in two different forms exist in two different forms okay so suppose this is one form of phytochrome one form of phytochrome this is another form of phytochrome okay so one form of phytochrome it absorbs light absorbs red light and the the form of phytochrome which absorbs which absorbs red light that is said to be pr so pr is the form of phytochrome which absorbs red light and after absorbing red light it will becomes pfr it becomes pfr okay and this pfr it absorbs it absorbs light which type of light which type of light far red light and because this form of pigment phytochrome is absorbing far red light that is why this is called as pfr okay so pr it becomes pfr after absorbing red light pfr it becomes pr after absorbing far red light okay and this form of phytochrome is inactive okay and this form of phytochrome is active okay and this pr is present in the cytosol this is membrane bound this is present in the cytosol this is present in, this is membrane bound okay so this is about the phytochrome this is about the phytochrome okay and remember one thing for short day plant for short day plant if the value of pr upon pfr is more than 1 flowering will take place and for long day plant for long day plant if the value of pfr upon pr is more than 1 flowering will take place so for flowering i can say for flowering in short day plant pr upon pfr should be more than 1 and for long day plant it, it should be less than 1 or i can say pfr upon pr should be more than 1 okay now what about the types of plants types of plants so the plants are classified into three groups 
long day plant short day plant and day neutral how can i classify that based on photopetism let me explain you okay so before that let me tell you one point that is critical photo period critical photo period is the duration of photo period which must be more in case of long day plant and which must not be more in case of short day plant the duration of photo period is called as critical photo period okay so above this above this line the photo period is more than critical photo period below this line the photo period is less than critical photo period okay so suppose suppose this is the plant okay suppose this is a plant okay uh, and in this case when in this case when uh, when the photo period is less than the critical photo period what happened the <coughs> sorry the flower developed the flower developed okay so these are the leaves okay so when the flowering took place if the photo period period the duration of photo period is less than the critical photo period but but if you increase if you increase the photo period and if the photo period becomes more than that of the critical photo period there is no flowering there is no flowering okay so there is no flowering only the leaves are present only the leaves are present okay so i can say here what happened the flowering took place okay when the flowering took place if the photo period is less than the critical photo period okay here there is no flowering and if there is no flowering so i can say it is present in the vegetative phase which phase vegetative phase so the plant in which flowering takes place if if the photo period is less than the critical photo period that plant is called as short day plant which plant short day plant okay now suppose this is a plant okay and these are the leaves these are the leaves okay and when when the photo the duration of photo period is less than the critical photo period there was no flowering so i can say it is in it is in vegetative phase which phase vegetative phase but when the photo period became more than that of the critical photo period what happened there was flowering there was flowering so suppose this is the plant okay and these are the leaves these are the leaves and this is the flower okay so this is the flower so the phase will, will be flowering phase so the plant in which the flowering takes place when the photo period is more than that of the critical photo period that is said to be long day plant which plant long day plant and if the flowering if in a plant the flowering takes place if the photo period is less than the critical photo period and if it the flowering takes place even in even the photo period is more than that of the critical photo period that, that type of plant, plant is called as day neutral plant so in case of day neutral plant the duration of the photo period and dark period is not going to affect the not going to affect the flowering okay so here the flowering will take place in every duration every phase every every condition okay so these are the leaves so whether the photo period is less than the critical photo period or more than the critical photo period it is not going to affect the day neutral plant okay so the flowering will take place the flowering will take place okay so such plant is called as day neutral plant okay so these are the three different types of plants okay and remember one thing if the short day plant is interrupted in the dark period with light it will not flower and if the long day plant in case of long day plant if the dark period is interrupted with the light it will it will flower so interruption of the dark period in the short day plant will inhibit the flowering and in case of long day plant it will promote the flowering so that part let me write here okay interruption interruption of dark period with light will in case of long day plant it will promote flowering it will promote flowering okay in case of short day plant it will inhibit flowering it will inhibit flowering 
so if you want to if you want to find out whether the plant is short day plant or long day plant you just interrupt the dark period with light and if it does not flower that means the the plant will be short day plant if and if it flowers that will be long day plant that will be long day plant okay so this was what photopetism so photopetism is basically the dependence of the plant uh, depend on dependence of the flowering on duration of what photo period and dark period that is known as photopetism this is observed in angiosperm because this is uh, related to the flowering and flowering is flower is found only in the angiosperm but this is not observed in all angiosperm this is observed in some angiosperms okay and remember one thing the structure hormone and the pigment which are involved in involved in the photoperiodism okay now let us talk about another phenomena which is related to the flowering and that is the vernal lesson in case of vernal lesson the flowering is dependent on the temperature either qualitatively or quantitatively so that is vernal lesson so i will say dependence of the flowering on low temperature either qualitatively or quantitatively either qualitatively or quantitatively that is called as vernal lesson and this is normally this is normally reversible so let me explain this point so if you provide a plant if you if you provide a plant with low temperature it develops the ability or capacity to flower it it is not necessary that it will flower it develops the capacity to flower so now if you treat that plant with hot uh, high temperature then it will lose that ability to flower so when we provide or treat the plant with low temperature that means when we are doing the vernal lesson what is happening the plant is gaining the ability to flower but if we treat the same plant with the high temperature it may lose the ability to flower that means the vernal lesson is reversible okay this is normally reversible okay and in case of vernal lesson in case of vernal lesson uh, there are different structures and hormones responsible so let me write that part so the structure the structure involved in one lysine is the shoot okay that that is the shoot okay not the leaf okay and the embryo the embryo present in seed present in seed okay so in shoot also i can write uh, shoot apical meristem i should write shoot apical meristem so these are the structures which are involved in what vernalizin okay so structure involved in vernalizin and this vernalizin also involves a hormone and the hormone which which is which participates in the vernalizin is vernalin in the, is vernalin and this vernalin is also hypothetical why is it hypothetical because it is not isolated yet because this is not isolated yet and that is why this is hypothetical okay and if you do not provide the plant with low temperature uh, uh, that is if you do not want if you do not vernalize a plant then you can treat the plant with gibberellin and it will flower so i can say gibberellin is a substitute of what vernalization okay so instead of providing low temperature if you treat the plant with gibberellin it may flower so i can say gibberellin is a substitute of what vernalization so i let me write that part okay so gibberellin or gibberellic acid is a substitute of what vernalization 
ओके तो डू यू थिंक दैट दिस वर्नलाइसिन इज एप्लीकेबल टू ऑल प्लांट्स नो दिस इज एप्लीकेबल टू ओनली विंटर वेराइटी ऑफ एनुअल प्लांट्स एंड बाइनेल प्लांट्स सो आई विल से दैट दिस वर्नलाइसन इज एप्लीकेबल is applicable to what winter variety of annual plants okay and it is applicable to biennial plants it is applicable to biennial plants okay this is not applicable to perennial plant this is not applicable to the spring variety of annual plants okay so let me explain you a little more about vernal lesson okay so suppose let me take a winter variety okay so normally under normal conditions we plant we plant the winter variety in autumn season okay so when we when i say pla i'm planting the plant in winter variety that means i'm sowing the seed i'm sowing the seed in the autumn season and in winter season what happens in winter season it will germinate it will germinate okay and in spring season it will grow properly even in winter season it will grow but in in spring season it will grow properly so it will show it will show it will grow or i can say it it will it will show growth which type of growth vegetative growth non not reproductive that means only the vegetative organs will grow not the reproductive organ and in the summer season it will flower so the flowering will take place which will take place flowering so under normal condition under natural condition the winter varieties of annual plants they are planted in the autumn season they will germinate in the winter season they will grow and that growth will continue till till spring season and they will ultimately flower in the summer season okay now if you if you take the winter variety if you take the winter variety and if you plant it in the spring season if you plant it in the spring season then what will happen there will be no flowering there will be no flowering and if you plant the winter variety if you take the same winter variety and if you plant in the if you plant in the spring season and if you provide low temperature artificially low temperature artificially then you will find that there will be flowering there will be flowering so from these three things we can conclude that we can conclude that the winter variety requires low temperature for flowering in the first case you can see when the plant is under uh, passing through the winter season it is getting low temperature naturally in the second case it is not getting any low temperature that is why there is no flowering in third case we are artificially providing the low temperature that is why there is flowering so i can say in winter variety low temperature should either be provided naturally or artificially then only flowering will take place if there is no low temperature there will be no flowering so i can say winter variety is, is winter variety is responsible uh, is uh, uh, winter uh, one lesson is applicable in winter variety of annual plants suppose there is a plant and that variety is spring variety that variety is spring variety and the spring variety is planted it is planted in the spring season and it flowers in the it flowers in the summer season okay so in this case there is no need of any low temperature even in the absence of low temperature there is formation of flowering okay so if you so if you if you uh, take a winter variety and if you plant it in plant it in the spring season and if you uh, and if you are allowing the flowering in the summer season that means in this case i, I can say this winter variety is converted into the spring variety and that is why we call this one lesson as springification because under normal condition this spring variety is planted in the spring spring season and flowers in the summer season and in this case also the winter variety is planted in the spring season and it it is flowering that means in this case no doubt the variety is winter variety but it is acting as spring varieties that means i can say if we provide low temperature then the winter variety may become spring variety okay 
and that is why the one lesson is called as springification <coughs> okay so this what uh, this was about one lesson so what about the significance of one lesson so let me write that part okay what about the significance of vanalizen so this vanalizen this vanalization it prevents the precocious reproductive development it prevents precocious reproductive development this is one significance how because it allows because it allows the plant to grow uh, grow vegetatively more okay see when the plant is undergoing uh, one lesson in this in the first case the one lesson is natural so when the plant is undergoing one lesson that means it is going uh, it is passing through the winter season and winter season is a long time period so when the plant passes through the winter season it, it gets more time to grow vegetatively properly first and when there is proper vegetative growth in the plant then it will it will so reproductive growth and it will it will produce flower so i will say if the vegetative growth is not proper the flowering will not be proper okay so for uh, and 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 if the flowering takes place before the proper vegetative growth i will call that as early reproductive growth or precocious reproductive growth or development okay and and the reproductive development should occur after proper vegetative growth after proper vegetative growth and for proper vegetative growth we require more time and the time is allowed when the uh, when the plant passes through the winter season that means when it uh, when it passes through the vernalization so the vernalization it allows the plant to have sufficient time to grow vegetatively first vegetatively first then it will show the reproductive development okay the the second significance is if you uh, see in this case in the first case the time period between germination or the planting and the flowering is very more very high but in the third case in the third case the time period between germination or the planting and the flowering is less so we can reduce the duration between the seed germination and the flowering if we plant a winter variety in the sp spring season and if we supply the we supply the plant with low temperature okay so that means the one lesson can reduce the time period between it, it can reduce the time period between germination and the flowering so i will say it reduces time period between seed germination and flowering if winter variety is planted in spring and treated with low temperature and treated with low temperature okay so this was about one lesson so let me repeat that part one lesson is a is is the dependence of the plant plants flowering on low temperature either qualitatively or quantitatively and this is a reversible process okay and the structure which is involved in the process of one lesson are the shoot apical meristem and the embryo present in the seed okay and the hormone which is involved in vanillin in case of flowering it, it was florigen in case of uh, one lesson it was vanillin okay and this is also hypothetical not isolated yet okay and this is applicable to uh, annual plant and biennial plants but not all annual annual plants it is applicable to winter variety of annual plants okay and this is applicable to biennial plants and and uh, and the significance of the one lesson is it prevents the precocious that means early reproductive development how by allowing the plant to have sufficient time for proper vegetative growth okay so let me write that part okay by allowing plant 
sufficient time for proper vegetative growth proper vegetative growth okay and the sec second significance is it reduces the time period be between seed germination in and flowering in case of winter variety if we plant that plant in the spring season and 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 if we apply the plant or uh, treat with the plant treat the plant with the low temperature okay so this was about vernalizing so now let us talk about the last topic and the topic is the the dormancy okay which one see dormancy but before discussing this see dormancy let me tell you one thing okay so whenever whenever the seed is formed whenever the seed is formed let me let me check the time the time is 2 hours 25 minutes okay see when the seed is formed the seed forms from the ovule and in the ovule there is embryo sac in the embryo sac there is zygote and the zygote becomes the embryo right so when the seed develops the embryo also develops right and the embryo in its, it was initially active but later on it becomes inactive so the embryo in the seed may become inactive or the embryo uh, the growth of the embryo suspends because of two different reasons okay in the seed there is embryo and the embryo when it, it developed from the zygote okay it was active but later later on it becomes inactive so the inact the inactivation of the embryo in the seed may be because of two different reasons because of external reason or internal reasons accordingly we classify that as different uh, different we can we can classify that let me tell that one, one by one okay so i can say the inactivation or the suspension Suspension of what? Embryonic growth. The growth of the embryo. The growth of the embryo in this seed. It may be because of two different reasons. It may be because of two different reasons. Okay. So the, the reasons can be, it may be because of, or I can write here, due to, it can be due to external factors. external factors or it may be due to some internal factors may be due to some internal factors and if the embryo in the seed is not growing its growth is suspended it is growth is paused stop now due to external factors that is called as quiescence what do you call that as quiescence but if the growth of the embryo is due to some reasons which are which are present in the seed or the internal factors that is called as dormancy so i can say dormancy both in dormancy and quiescence there is stoppage or the pause of the or uh, suspension of the embryonic growth and uh, the reason is different in case of dormancy the reasons are internal in case of quiescence the uh, reasons are external like if the temperature is extreme or if the, there is no water or dryness uh, there will be there will be dormancy there will be sorry there will be uh, there will be quiescence okay now let us try to understand the dormancy more detail okay so the sea dormancy is nothing but the suspension of the growth of the embryo growth of embryo due to internal factors due to internal factors that is called as dormancy and this dormancy is very very important because it allows us to store this seed this allows us to store this seed okay so the significance i can say this this allows this allows or permits us for storage of to store seed to store seed okay 
so what are the factors which are responsible for c dormancy which promote this c dormancy one is presence of certain chemicals and because these chemicals are not going to cause the c dormancy that means because they are going to prevent the growth of the embryo that is why they are called as chemical inhibitors so in the presence of certain chemical inhibitors there be, there may be c dormancy so what are the chemical inhibitors i can say the inhibitors can be abscisic acid phenolic compounds phenolic compounds okay para ascorbic acid para ascorbic acid okay comma in short chain fatty acid etc so these are the different chemicals if they are present in the seed they will inhibit the seed germination and seed germination and they will promote the seed dormancy okay and if if there is no chemical inhibitors but if the seed coat is tough if the seed coat is tough and impermeable to gases then the germination will not take place and if there is no germination that means there is dormancy okay so if the there is no chemical inhibitors but if the seed coat is not uh, not favorable for germination there will be dorm dormancy and uh, and uh, uh, when the seed coat will be not favorable for germination if the seed coat is tough that means in that case the plumal and radical they, they cannot come out of the they cannot come out of the seed coat that means there will be no germination and if there is uh, the seed coat is impermeable to gases th there will be no germination because during germination there should be aerobic respiration in the embryonic cells and for aerobic respiration there should be oxygen and the oxygen should come out come outside the uh, seed okay for uh, for entry of the uh, entry of the oxygen into the embryo uh, uh, into the embryo or into the seed the, the seed core should be permeable but uh, but suppose there is a condition in which there is no chemical inhibitors and the the seed coat is also uh, soft and permeable but still there can be there can be seed dormancy how if this if the embryo is immature that will inhibit the germination that will promote the dormancy so for germination for germination for germination means seed germination for germination the embryo the embryo present in the the embryo present in the seed should be mature should be mature if the embryo is immature there will be no germination there will be no germination so among these three any of the reasons if present uh, any of the factors is present that that will cause the dormancy that will cause the dormancy so these are the reasons so how can we break the dormancy let me explain that one by one so here i'm going to explain you what just a minute okay fine so how so how can we so how can we break the dormancy let me tell you one by one okay so here i'm going to explain you methods to to break dormancy so how can we break dormancy the methods of breaking dormancy can be natural or can be artificial so let me write that part first okay so it can be it can be natural or it can be artificial it can be artificial different methods are there different methods are there okay so here i'm going to explain you two different methods one is one is the carification okay and second one is the stratification second one is the stratification 
when do you perform this stratification if the dormancy is due to certain chemicals if the dormancy is due to certain chemicals we do the stratification if the if the dormancy is due to the seed coat we perform the scarification okay so in stratification what do we do we treat the seed with what we we treat the seed with certain chemicals like nitrate okay and or gibberellin so the application of nitrate or gibberellin they promote the uh, seed germination they 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 break the seed dormancy okay and you can also you can also <coughs> overcome the seed dormancy by treating the seed with low temperature and oxygen low temperature and oxygen okay so if you if you treat the dormant seed with low temperature and oxygen the dormancy will be broken if you treat the seed with certain chemicals like nitrate and gibberellic acid the dormancy will break so when do we perform this stratification the stratification we perform if this if the dormancy is due to seed coat okay so how can we do this then we uh, if the seed coat is seed coat is tough we can may we can weaken it how can we weaken it we can rub the seed coat with the sandpaper or knife okay and we can we can also shake the seed vigorously so ultimately this seed coat will become weak okay so i can say uh, <coughs> i can say the scarification can be done by uh, by rubbing or scratching scratching with the help of knives okay we can rub it with the help of sandpaper or we can also we can also shake the seeds vigorously okay vigorously so i can say vigorous shaking vigorous shaking okay so these are the these are the artificial means these are the artificial means to break the dormancy to break the dormancy okay so suppose suppose there is a bird or animal which takes the fruit okay and it eats the other parts except the seed then then what happens the seed will pass through the gut and when this uh, when the seed passes through the gut the digestive enzymes will act on the seed coat and they will ma make the seed coat weak okay and this is natural method this is natural method or suppose there is a there is a seed which is which is present in the soil and that the seed will be acted upon the microbes okay the microbes or decomposers and uh, the microbes will actually release the release the digestive enzymes and that will cause the weakening of the seed coat okay and this is also natural this is also natural okay so i can say i can say so this is artificial this is artificial and it can and this scarification can be done naturally this can be done naturally how by microbial action or this this can also be done when the seed passes through passes through gut of other organisms like bird birds and other animals birds and other animals okay so this is natural this is natural this is natural okay and in in all these cases in all these cases what do we do we we can we we can the seed coat we we can the seed coat okay so the, these are the different methods of seed dormancy breaking the seed dormancy or overcoming the seed dormancy okay so dormancy is basically the suspension of the growth of the embryo and this is due to the certain internal factors the internal factor may be the presence of immature embryo or maybe the presence of certain chemical inhibitors or maybe due to the presence of the seed coat which is tough and impermeable to gases okay and this seed dormancy is very very important why because this allows us to store the seed okay and it allows the plant uh, pl seed to over to 
टू पास थ्रू दी स्ट्रेसफुल कंडीशन दिस अलाउज दी टू पास थ्रू दी स्ट्रेसफुल कंडीशन ओके एंड दिस the and the uh, dormancy can be broken by two different methods one is one is the scarification second is the stratification and remember one thing which are what are the chemicals which we pro, which we pro, which we use to overcome this c, uh, c dormancy it is the uh, gibberellic acid and the nitrate okay gibberellic acid and the nitrate Nit gibberellic acid it actually it helps in the mobilization of the food during germination okay so this is important and the nitrate is also important so the, this is all about the chapter of plant growth and development hope you have enjoyed this so thank you everyone thank you so much uh, let's meet in the next class take care bye